Good morning. All right. I heard a bring it out there. That's Wendell's trademark. I hope everybody had a good Christmas morning. It may not be finished with you as yet, but I hope you had a good time this morning if you got up early enough to maybe exchange gifts and open presents and that type of thing. Uh, We did this morning. We had 20 people at the house for supper last night. I counted. I think I'm right. Sounds like a church potluck, doesn't it? Yeah. (laughs) I've already used my jokes in my class about the used parking lot up in front of the house. It's the way it looks. It's the way it is. That's okay. All right. This is Christmas. All right. (laughs) Uh, More importantly, it's the Lord's Day, and we're here to worship God and to uh, come before Him in spirit and in truth. And think on some things that I hope will help us. I'm going to take us this morning to 1 Samuel, two chapters, chapter 4, chapter 7. And uh, Kyle has read the text, and I'm trying to narrow the text down to just a few verses here that will focus attention on uh, two names that are uh, familiar to us. They are familiar to us not only from the Bible, uh, but also from English literature. Uh, Ichabod and uh, Ebenezer. And those of you who are astute students of English lit uh, probably have uh, read uh, George Washington Irving's, um, uh, Washington Irving, whatever it is, uh, Legend of Sleepy Hollow, and Ichabod Crane, okay? And that comes up this time of year, having a little bit of a Christmas connection. I don't know exactly how much. I've never read it. And then, of course, uh, there's Ebenezer. Uh, And I've already watched uh, my Christmas Carol movie uh, for this year. Uh, The one that I like best is uh, the 1984 version with George C. Scott and Ebenezer Scrooge, so we connect with that, you know, Charles Dickens and so forth. Now, those two names, uh, Ichabod and Ebenezer, uh, interestingly enough, uh, have a place in the Bible, the Old Testament, and both of those names suggest something of uh, falling and redemption. Ichabod, in Old Testament history, means the glory of God has departed. Ebenezer is something that, and Brad used one of the songs that, that I suggested earlier, that employs the the name, Ebenezer. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Okay. Well, in 1 Samuel 7, the connection there. And there's something interesting about that term Ebenezer, that it really is more personal than you might think. And I want us to take home a few lessons uh, regarding it this morning. But in terms of both of these names... I want us to think just a little bit about what the, New, the Old Testament suggests to us regarding Ichabod and Ebenezer. We begin in chapter 4 of uh, 1 Samuel. And chapter 4 of 1 Samuel divides itself into two sections, basically, verses 1 through 11, 
will cover the military campaigns of um, Israel against the Philistines and great loss of life that is recorded there, verses 1 through 11. And then from verse 12 or so down to the end of the chapter, uh, the focus here is on Eli when he receives the news that his sons have been killed. Uh, He has a very strong and immediate reaction to that, as any of us would. And he falls backwards, breaks his neck, dies. It's not exactly good news, is it? But then there's somebody else that comes into the focus, and that is Eli's daughter-in-law, whose husband has been killed. And she's about to give birth. And she dies in the process. But she, before her death, is noted for her final words. And her final words become the focus of our attention here this morning. And I draw your attention to verses 21, 22. Then she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God has had been captured, and because her father in law of her father in law and her husband. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. The name Ichabod, interesting name. The chapter here ends somewhat tragically particularly with regard to the death of Eli and uh, Eli's daughter-in-law and her last words here. I want you to think just a moment about the meaning of that name, Ichabod. The glory of the Lord has departed. Now, one of the strange things about this chapter is Israel's confidence in the ark of God. Not that they shouldn't have confidence in it, but that their confidence was misplaced. Because they've looked at the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, as something of a talisman, a good luck charm, that now that it's in their presence, they can't lose. But they do lose. And the Ark is captured by the Philistines. And thus, these closing words that call attention to it and attach the name Ichabod to a newborn baby and the the name Ichabod, Ichabod means the glory has departed. Connected with the ark. Their confidence misplaced. Someone said one time, that Ichabod could be written over the front door of some churches. And I have no doubt, you know, that that's true. I don't question that. I, I wring my hands and I, I, I'm sad when that's true, when it is true. And when you hear of examples of where the glory of God has departed and the congregation of the Lord's people no longer, for whatever reason, reflect the glory of God in their lives or in their teaching. The glory of God has departed. They're a group of people that basically have a denominational status. The glory of God has departed. They may not know it, But in truth, it has. And that ought to cause a tear to run down your cheek when you think about the reality of things like that. The glory of God has departed. And I wouldn't pass judgment on, uh, you know, uh, how often that happens. And uh, it's tragic. But it's also tragic 
when the glory of God departs from you, and I mean personally, individually, do you go through life? I know we're here this morning on what we call Christmas Day. And as I pointed out to you last week, sadly enough, there are some CEOs in the church, Christmas, Easter only people who would never miss those holidays. But in reality, is the glory of God there? God is judge. Has the glory of God departed the lives of people? Have you ever felt throughout this year, this calendar year, that things have gone awry in your world and somehow the glory of God has departed, but somehow you got back up and you renewed your strength and you prayed again and you opened your Bible and you assemble again with the saints and the glory of God is renewed. The real tragedy is when the glory of God is departed, is written above the door of people's lives and hearts, and it stays there. That's the negative side of this lesson this morning. Ichabod, the glory has departed. Sad. The chapter ends on a negative note. Sometimes people's lives continue on a negative note. Now let's go to 1 Samuel 7. And in chapter 7, there's an interesting thing, and I've, I draw your attention simply to verse 12 of chapter 7. And... In verse 12, Samuel took a stone and he set it up between Mizpah and Shin and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. As we have already evidenced this morning, you know, we, we sing the song that uses the term Ebenezer. Here I raise my Ebenezer. And I wonder, we ever stop and think about it? And few people probably realize that the word Ebenezer, name Ebenezer, has a meaning. And if your Bible is like mine, it has a little footnote there with the name Ebenezer. And down at the bottom of the page, literally, stone of help. And that tells me the meaning of the term. I sing it. I don't think about it. But the word has a meaning. Stone of help. And <clears throat> attached to that stone are these words from Samuel. Thus far, up to this point, the Lord has helped us. We didn't get here on our own. And in 1 Samuel 7, Israel learned a hard lesson. And that hard lesson was that they needed help, particularly from God. And thus the name Ebenezer and the meaning that is attached to it. I want to ask you a question this morning. What are your Ebenezers? Do you have any? Is there anything in your life that reminds you That the Lord has been with you up to this point, up to this day, however long you've lived, how many trips around the sun you've made, the Lord has been with you up to this point. What reminders do you have? Well, let me name a few. Birthdays might be one of them. Birthdays, something as simple as a B-day. And if we're among the blessed, then we might be like that mentioned in Psalm 90, verses 10 through 12, that the days of a person's life are three score and ten. And if 
you make it to four score, it's a hard road to hoe. It gets tough, doesn't it? And I'm paraphrasing. Psalm 90, 10 through 12. Birthdays. But you count those birthdays and you mark them off. But you remember, you didn't get here alone. God has helped you all along the way. That's an Ebenezer, basically. That we've, we've lived long enough and we've been around long enough and we're part of a church that wears the name of Jesus. And we're here because God has helped us, brethren. But a second thing that I might include in this are the people that sit next to you. I don't mean just family. I'm talking about friends. Spiritual family. People with whom you rub elbows. People help you along the way. In Proverbs 18.24, Solomon said that there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. We think of that as being Jesus. It is. But he, Solomon used it in human terms. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I have a brother. He's a couple of years younger than me. I used to be able to beat him up. I can't anymore. I wouldn't try. I think he could take me out pretty quick. But I love my brother. And we've gotten closer in the last few years than we've ever been, I guess. He lives in Houston, Texas. We call one another, usually on birthdays. He'll call me on my birthday, and if I remember, I'll call him. I don't always remember. But we connect pretty good. Is there a friend that sticks closer than a brother? How many people have you known in your world, in your life, that without them, you don't know where you'd be today? You're not sure you'd be here if it weren't for them. That might be your husband, might be your wife. My good-looking bride of 46-plus years has brought me to this point. I wouldn't be here today without her. So people, they get you from one place to another. They help you move along in life. They become an Ebenezer to help you along the way. And you wouldn't want to do without them. And then there's prayer. Prayer is an Ebenezer. And I say it, I say that because in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 11, where Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and appreciative of them for helping him to basically gather up the collection for the suffering saints in Judea. And in verse 11, interestingly enough, he mentions how that they have helped him with their prayers. Their prayers, he said, have been a help to me. That's interesting. We ask people to pray for us on occasion because we need the help. We pray for people because we want to help them. And perish the thought that we might ever say to somebody, well, I, nothing I can do for you, but I can pray what have we just done? We have destroyed our Ebenezer. Praying is the greatest thing you can do for somebody. That will help them. Pray for them. Lift their names up to the Lord and Savior. That's an Ebenezer. 2 Corinthians 1, 11 is a reminder of that. And then one other Ebenezer. And you need each of these. But you need this one above all, and that's your Bible. That Bible that you brought with you this morning, hopefully. That Bible may be nothing more than the quality of a pew Bible. Cheap, 
in bad condition, but you've carried it with you many years, and it's your Bible. Oh, back in the first part of November, I guess it was, Kathy and I went down to Orange Beach, and we spent some time with David and Kristen and Kessler. I call him Baby K. And I uh, had a couple of Bibles to work on while I was down there, repair. Uh, <clears throat> one belonged to Tom Campbell, and another one to my mother-in-law, my, my son's mother-in-law, David's mother-in-law. And she had sent a Bible that was just a very cheap Bible, very inexpensive, uh, <clears throat> bonded leather, and it was, you wouldn't believe the condition it was in. It was twisted, and the cover, the spine was twisted inward, and pages everywhere, and sections coming out. All, it was in terrible shape. It was just a cheap little Bible. And I'm thinking, I don't know what's so important about this Bible, but it's important to her, so I spent a few days working on it. And I got it back together for her. And um, it didn't look great, but it looked better than it did. And a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, whatever it was, maybe been longer than that, got a little thank you card in the mail from her, along with a gift card. But she wrote a little note to how much she appreciated my repairing that Bible for her because she has so many notes in it that were invaluable to her. There's the Ebenezer. The help of cheap, inexpensive, bonded leather Bible. But it's full of notes that she needed and wanted because it's been her help all along the way, you see. I told that story. I didn't intend to get into that, I don't guess, and it t took up most of my time. But it makes a point, doesn't it? I hope. You have a Bible, probably have some notes in the margin of it. That's your Ebenezer, because that gets you along the way. It's your help. And you don't want to do without it. Think about these terms. Ichabod. It's sad. The glory has departed. Nobody wants that. And that's the downfall of humanity. Where people have fallen away from God and into sin. Separated from God and from other people. But the positive side of this is that there are some Ebenezers in your life. That if you recognize them for what they are, and if you appreciate them, and if you remain connected to them, they will help you. Those birthdays, the people that you love, the prayers that you covet, and the Bible that you carry. Ebenezer's stones of help to get you from here to eternity. Don't leave it alone, okay? Use it and let it help you. Don't let the glory of God depart. Come to Him. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Would you repent of your sins? Would you admit to people that you believe that Jesus Christ is in fact the Son of God? Would you obey Him in baptism for the remission, the forgiveness, the sending away of your past sins? Would you rise as a new creature and hang on to that glory? And keep those Ebenezer's in place while we stand, sing to encourage him.